Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be with you in this excellent Horasis event about with a big focus on trust. And in this particular panel, I've got with me some great speakers, and we're going to be talking about I have also Eric Hespenheider. Eric is the chair of the board of directors of GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative. Then we have Joram Schreven. Joram is the director of impact and ESG at FMO, which is the Dutch Development Bank. And at the moment also with me, Jordi Marti, who is professor of economics at the University of Barcelona. Now we're also waiting for a, a Another panelist who will be joining us, uh, Prince Sunday Adeojo, uh, who's the Vice President of BioDry2 Energy. When Sunday joins us, I'll reintroduce him to you. But we're going to kick off now with the panel that we have here at the moment, uh, which ranges from academics to practitioners to also governance aspects of ESG. And I really just want to open this out a little bit. ESG. So what does ESG stand for? Let me ask you first, Eric, to give us a, a quick definition, a little bit about what you're doing, and just tell us about ESG, and then we'll build the conversation around that. Uh, great. Uh, you know, so I'm happy to do that. I think, uh, you know, ESG in its simplest form is, envi form is environmental, social, and governance. I think uh, what, uh, what uh, we've struggled with over a number of years is what to call this, you know, information that we're trying to derive. Uh, so, you know, we've had, you know, used to we had uh, corporate sustainability uh, reports. Uh, then we had ESG. I think now, you know, a lot of people are landing on sustainability, you know, as a more encompassing term uh, for what we're talking about. So it's had a bit of an evolution. Uh, but ESG is, is still shorthand for a lot of the information that we're talking about that, that uh, are, you know, clearly are not associated directly at the moment with uh, financial results, but they also have a great deal of, of impact on financial results. So, uh, but in, in a little bit about GRI, you know, so we have been around 20 plus years, you know, we have created a initially guidelines on how companies can be transparent about the impacts they're having on society and the world uh, and the environment. Uh, and now we have standards, GRI standards. So we're in the, in the business of, of creating the, the standards that are used by companies to illuminate their issues, uh, impacts on the world, as well as the impacts on themselves. Eric, that's great. Thank you very much for setting the scene for us. Now, you said there's environmental, social and governance. I'd love to turn to Jeanette. Jeanette, as a board director, but also having been in the management team at Danske Bank, focusing on this as well. How do you see the governance piece? I find the governance piece uh, hugely important uh, because, first of all, you can say when you look at a board, it's also there that you have uh, most of the decision in power. So making sure that this highest level of the company is really interested in the role of the company in society, understand that the company is here also for the stakeholders is is, is crucially, uh, hugely important, I, I would say. Um, then, of course, when you relate it to ESD, you also have some particular measures that you can look at and then you can report on, like what kind of salary packages do you have? What is the composition of the board? Is it a modern board? For how long time are the people sitting there? Uh, and so on and so on. So there are many things that you can also so look at very concretely. But I think it starts with looking at the role of the board and that the board is putting uh, sustainability and the role of the company in society in on the agenda, basically. I think that's very important. Interesting. I mean, it seems to me that governance is something that uh, when we talk about rebuilding investor trust, it seems to me that governance is a, a subject that's been pretty high up the agenda for the last uh, several years. But on the other hand, perhaps the others, the E and the S, are relative newcomers to the party. 
Um, someone was suggesting to me that environment was the next one that people stepped into, and that started really to build up in the corporate environment maybe 10 years ago, and that actually it's really the last 20, well, the last 12 months of COVID that has put a huge focus on the S. Yorim, I'd like to turn to you because you bridge. You bridge the investor piece and also the governance piece because you have got, you're an investor in private companies. FMO is investing in private companies around the world and you are in charge of ESG and impact at FMO. H how do you bridge that between the investor who has to have trust in it and the investee companies? Excellent question, uh, Pierre. So you're quite right. So we, we actually invest in these companies in, in typically quite challenging environments, emer emerging economies, developing countries. Um, and uh, and then we actually have investors like pension funds who co-invest with us in these, uh, in, in, in these assets. So it's crucial to us that we actually help build trust in, in what we do. And I'd say there's actually um, three or four key elements that maybe we can unpick a bit more today uh, that build up to that trust. So I think the first one is really the classic risk management side, um, which at the investor side is, are you protecting me um, from, for example, reputational risk? I don't want to be associated with a big environmental damage or a social issue or a violation of human rights uh, in the press. But it can also simply be that, um, that they lose money on their investment as a, as a direct result. Of an, uh, of an ENS issue, for example, um, or a governance issue for that matter. I think it's risk management is absolutely crucial to, uh, to building that trust in this space. Then I think it's also important, especially for the investors that they, um, that, that they understand and see through business case for ESG. So how does it ultimately also contribute to the bottom line of an investment to an investee of FMO generating a higher return ultimately? Um, I think the third part of, of building trust uh, is at both levels, actually. So trust of FMO in our investees, but also trust of our investors in FMO, that we at FMO integrate ESG thoroughly into our organization. So it's really a shift eh, from where some organizations are treating it as, say, CSR, do a little bit of good somewhere tucked away in an organization and shifting it into uh, integrating it in in, uh, in all parts of your organization uh, and, and ensuring that it's core to your investment process. And I think the then final leg is really external verification and, and reporting and, and being accountable for the for the results that you uh, that you achieve. Um, and of course, interesting element there is also sustainability type rating. So FMO, for example, has a uh, has the best ESG rating from Sustainalytics uh, out of more than twelve thousand. Um, companies in their database. Uh, so I think that, uh, that that definitely helps as well in in building trust vis-a-vis -vis investors. Joram, that's really interesting. You talked about accountability. I'm going to come on to Jordi in a second. But before I leave you, Joram, I want to just pick up an element you were talking about on risk. I mean, what, one of the questions is, is all this really about, is it defensive? Is it actually just defending organizations, defending investors with respect to risk in their portfolio or the investee companies? Or is it something about value creation? Is there actually any value creation in ESG that an investor can see? What is it? How do you how can you find that? Because surely that's got to be as interesting as just simply protecting from risk. Totally agree. So I think it is very much both. You see, historically, it's it started often in the in the protection side, do no harm, um, and and limit downside. And and increasingly, I think uh, we're all realizing that there is indeed a business case. There is a value creation side to all of this uh, as well. So um, if you look at the value creation uh, elements of it, you can you can definitely uh, see benefits in terms of uh, accessing. Uh, more funders, right? As a, as a business that does well on, on ESG. And ultimately, if it's easier to access uh, funding, that will drive your bottom line. And therefore, if you're an equity investor, probably also your return again. Um, we see that in exits, uh, typically it expands your scope uh, for who can you sell to and also actually valuation multiples. It was an interesting, uh, interesting study from, from IFC where uh, they actually said 100% of people interviewed 
said that good ESG practices uh, would uh, uh, induce them to pay a premium, especially in emerging markets. Uh, and I think McKinsey had a study to say that the premium could be as high as 28 percent. So there's some some real indicators that good ESG practices uh, not only protect you from from some downside, but actually generate value. That 28% is a huge number. If that's really true, that outweighs the risk premium that people are applying to an awful lot of emerging markets. So it would be great to see that really happen. Um, I I had both Janet and Eric were raising their hands to pitch in with something there. Um, Let let me, Janet, come to you now quickly with a comment, uh, your comment. No, but it's just that I, I very much agree of, of what, has all, what has been said. And also, if you take the company perspective, the understanding that this is also a strong business case is also in many ways what is driving this in the companies. Because companies are beginning to understand that if you do this right, if you succeed with ESG or sustainability broadly spoken, then you, are, you can better attract Uh, the best people, you're more attractive toward customers, you can attract the right investors, Uh, you are probably also ahead of regulation. So there are many, many things that also builds a strong business case from the company perspective itself. Um, So I just wanted to, uh, to chip that in. Great. Thanks very much, Jeanette. Eric, I'm going to come back to you, but I'm going to go to Jordi first, because we were talking about accountability. One of the things around all of this is, is transparency as well. And Jordi, you've spent several years trying to actually make sense out of ESG accounting as a way of really defining value in organizations, in corporations. Can you tell us a bit about that and tell us how has the needle moved in the dial? Where has it come from in terms of initial interest to where it is now? Well, uh, I think that uh, according with the Jeanette, um, AG um, try to make sexy a company. If a company uh, complains all the rules of the AG, the GRA of Eric is a way to show all of these rules. This company is a company that all the founders, all the uh, savers wants to invest in, in these uh, equities. From this point of view, from the accountability point of view, we try to introduce the AG issues as a warranty of long-term profitability. If a company is capable to create value added, this company has to share this value added. Historically, this value added is divided between labor forces and capital forces. According with Adam Smith, uh, Wealth of Nations, we have companies creating value added and this value added is divided, distributed in uh, labor, uh, salaries, uh, wages, something like that, and other margins, profits, earnings for the capital. If we introduce environment here, we introduce a new variable that uh, could manage the company in another sense. We create more value and we distribute this new value in another way, absolutely different that the history show uh, us just now. And I think this is uh, the first force to get trust to the savers, to the investees, to the investors, in order to make more sure the next generations, the sustainability that is the the last purpose of age. Jordi, I I absolutely get the value of that. The challenge that I see is how do I, as an investor, know whose reporting is the right reporting? Who's actually telling me anything that is meaningful because there seems to be an alphabet soup of standards out there, and I, I don't know which one to choose. I'm just a simple investor. So, so h- how do I get to that? Now, I know that you're the specialist in terms of, 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 of the accounting of that value. Eric, you've been working on this reporting side. Give us, help us to understand that alphabet soup. Help us to understand what's happening now to change the dynamic and make it easier for me, the simple investor, to understand what's going on. Uh, sure, I'll be happy to answer that question. I do want to respond, though, to this the, the earlier point, and, and sure. excuse me for that, but I, I think yeah. it's important because you know what uh, you know what what 
what we've tried to do from a GRI standpoint is to is to shift this idea that the information on environmental impacts and societal impacts are for the benefit of others. Uh, and it really is for the benefit of the company. Because who wouldn't want to know more about how their company operates, what the impacts they're having? And so so this idea that it's for the benefit of others really is a, you know, needs to change. It, it, it's increasing the aperture of what is taken on board by decision makers inside the company, outside the company's consumers. And, and companies, you know, if, if they're not reporting truthfully or fully, it's, you know, it's unfortunate because they could learn so much more about how to run their business, how to add value to their business if they actually take on board and gain, gain an understanding of these, of these social impacts and environmental impacts. So I just, that's a little bit of my soapbox to answer your question now in terms of the alphabet soup. Mm-hmm. You know, GRI has been part of a you know, quote unquote group of five uh, other framework providers and standard setters, uh, the uh, uh, SASB, IRC, uh, CDSB, CDP. Uh, and, and really what we're trying to do is, is present a comprehensive picture of what a improved uh, corporate disclosure regime, reporting regime would look like. Uh, and so we d- issued a couple of papers last year. We continue to work collectively uh, with the IFRS Foundation and, and uh, the EU, uh, EFRAG, in terms of, you know, how to, how to really bring this together. So, to, you know, we've heard this alphabet soup terminology for quite some time. You know, I, you know I, I don't push back on it anymore because there are a lot of acronyms out there. But reality is there aren't very many, you know, and I think sometimes it gets conflated with rankers and raiders asking questions uh, and, and other, other groups that have you know things to say, uh, but it gets lumped into this idea that there's lots of standard setters. In reality, there's actually very few. There are very few, but when I'm a company, um, I seem to, and I'm being told by my sources of capital, I'm being told by one set of shareholders that they want me to apply a particular set of standards. I'm being told by another set of shareholders, they want me to apply a different set of standards. I'm being told by the EU regulator that I've got to, uh, got to abide by yet another set of standards. How do I choose? How do I find what, 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 who's going to succeed? Who's going to come out of this as BHS rather than Betamax? Who's going to be really the standard? Or what is going well, to you know, I, you know, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. It might make my day job a little easier, but, uh, it's a, uh, I think what we're seeing is an evolution and, it, and it's, it's taking some time, but I do think we're going to get there. And if you look at the timeframes, uh, and, and what the EU and the New Deal that they have, uh, they're embarking upon, and their need for information to determine one, you know, what's our baseline, and then most importantly, are we making the right progress in the areas and where we're trying to redirect our economy and, and society uh, as part of that green deal? And that's where, and so that's why this transparency and this measurement is so critically important. Uh, and it's playing out in the U.S. to a lesser extent that we could talk to if you like. But it's, uh, you know, so I think it's a matter of, of timing because if you look at the aspirations that they have, they want a first set of standards to be mandatorily required by in place by the end of 2022. Well, that's, you know, 18 months from now. Uh, and so that's very quick. And so I think that will cause a, a, a quick consolidation. Not everybody will agree necessarily in of some of this, you know, and once it becomes mandatory uh, in an EU setting, uh, whether you operate there or are uh, listed on, on as a listed company in, in the EU, It'll have a ripple effect around the world as companies look at it. So I think I think we're seeing that. You know, the IFRS Foundation is is talking about standing up their sustainability standards board again as a, a point of consolidation. Uh, so I think you know we're we're getting closer. I think to answer your other question about what information, you know, it, so when you get information demands, uh, there is what I would call uh, sustainability data or ESG data, and then there is uh, sustainability reporting. Uh, in the broader sense of it, in, in terms of tell me what your emissions are is a, a sustainability data. Tell me how that's going to impact your business in the future and talk about the, you know, the, the consequences of what you're doing. That's reporting. You know, so there's there's lots of it, demands for data because people want data in order to run their models and, and do their rating and rankings and so on. But I think there's going to be a growing 
discussion about, you know, data versus reporting, in, in, meaning that you, you now have it in context. What does it actually mean to the operations of the individual company and to society at large? Thanks. Thanks very much, Eric. Jeanette, you were raising your hand and I'm going to come to you now. You've got obviously something to build on that. But then I also have a specific question for you in this context, too. But but building on what we just heard, I think, I mean, from the company perspective, it takes so much resource to get this right. And that's why the, the standards and, and whatever converging of all of this is, is, is crucial, is, is, uh, is hugely important um, so that companies understand where to go with this and, and what to use uh, to make it simple. Uh, the other point I would make is that this is also going to be driven very much by the investors. Um, and because what is it that they would be asking for? And what we're also seeing a lot at the moment, in at least in, in, in very much in Scandinavia, is that investors are also asking much more for when it comes to target setting. Uh, they want big companies to come up with the science-based targets. They want them to report a TCFD in terms of what kind of climate risks and opportunities do they see. Uh, so all of this also needs to be looked at um, because that's going to be part of the bigger picture in terms of what is expected from a company uh, to be a, a strong player in this. Now, I was talking a couple of weeks ago to the head of sustainability at a large bank here in France, and he said to me that the really interesting thing, because when you're talking about investors, a lot of us think in terms of institutional investors. He said that the really interesting thing for him with the EU's initiative was it was going to build confidence at the level of the retail investors, because retail investors who have been asking for a long time, saying, well, interest rates are so low, give me at least some other benefit associated with my with the, with my money mm -hmm. um, and make sure that it's going to a good use. Now, those retail investors have been working in the dark and the brokers, if you like, the banks um, that manage their capital have not actually been able to give them the products they're looking for. His argument is that the EU sustainability standards will crack that open substantially. You, how do you see that as a banker, as a former banker? Do you see that retail wave coming? I do, and I think what we saw in Danske Bank was also that the retail customers were increasingly interested in investing sustainably. Uh, and, and to come up with the right products, you also need to know how do you define what is green and what is not green. And that's where, as an example, the new EU taxonomy uh, is going to help because you will get sort of a common understanding across countries and across products and all of that in terms of how to define what is what. Um, so I do think that the regulation, even though it, it's big, it's going to be difficult, it's going to take out a lot of resources to get it right, it's also going to help. I definitely believe so. Excellent. Jordi, you were raising a hand. Yes, and uh, to come only in. a practical case in, in the last month in Spain, start the first commercial banks uh, giving loans indexed with ASG rating and you can find more little cost of your financial funds if you accomplish these uh, rules of the ESG. That means that, uh, well, the ancient financial directors has to be re reconverted in sustainable directors. And we need that all the financial analyst has to in, to change the, the mind, as, uh, in order the Eric words, no? in the financial analysis needs to introduce new issues, new variables, and to recommend to the investors no? new strategies for the future. No? Because in a short term, it's easier to make money. In this pandemic uh, time, it's more easier to make money in the next two years. Hmm? But more long of this term, we have problems. Hmm? Is the problem is sustainability. Hmm? And if the financial directors understand this, they have to change uh, several decisions in order to guarantee the profits in the future. So I think also what you're highlighting there, Jordi, is that essentially... 
for a company building this in, really integrating it into their operations is also going to give them a competitive edge in terms of cost of capital. Mm-hmm. They're going to be more attractive in terms of their cost of capital. Let me come to you, Yorin, because you're, in, you're an investor and you're investing in companies. Now, if you see a company, when you're looking at the investment committee, at the investment thesis, the business thesis, the impact thesis, are you going to reduce the cost of your capital when you see a company that has a better SD, ESG performance than someone else? Or are you going to stick with your cost of capital on your benchmark? Right. Excellent question. Yeah. So what we do is we do a, a very thorough, actually, due diligence first on, on where does the company stand on E, the S and the G uh, vis-a-vis our standards. Uh, in our case, the operational standard is the IT performance standards, but we look at quite a few others as well, including the OECD guidelines and the um, UN guiding principles, etc. cetera. Um, now, typically, you will identify uh, some gaps. Then uh, you, you agree an action plan together with the client to, uh, to close these gaps uh, because we're operating in, in, in developing countries, so the, the, the situation is typically not yet at international standards, but we work together to get there. Um, now, what we what we actually do is we, we assess all of these risks and we weight um, these these risks in our actual credit scoring models. Um, as I as I like to say, uh, when mi- misfortune meets bad governance, FMO loses money. And we've actually reflected that in our uh, credit risk scoring models as well. So they they get a weight, and it means that essentially uh, we need to hold less capital against a company that scores very good, for example, on, on its governance practices. And similarly, we also look at the, uh, the ENS risks. So that's one way in which um, improved uh, ESG practices, either at inception or later on, as we do repeat deals, can, can feed into lower pricing in practice. And what we've also done uh, selectively is uh, where we have a lot riding on an action plan with a client where we really feel this is, this is a very important part of, of the plan and we, uh, we consider uh, our risk materially reduced if the, uh, if the client can actually implement this action that we, um, that we include an explicit margin reduction in the deal itself, that when that is achieved, uh, we will reduce our, uh, our margins. So yes, uh, indeed, we are linking our uh, uh, financial pricing to the ESG practices and, uh, and it's done as well. Yeah. That's good. So you're putting your money where your mouth is. Very That's nice, right. Right. indeed. And and using levers, using the, lever, the, the the leverage that you as an investor have got in order to purposefully change things, as opposed to just simply defending yourself from risk. That's quite right. Really? And maybe to that point, no. um, also also on, on on Eric's observation that it's important in the in the reporting uh, to focus on the the sphere of 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 what actually uh, impacts the company. Um, I, I think I think that's an important element in, in what's going on. So I would agree. Uh, what, what tends to happen at the moment is people end up confusing uh, a number of different lenses. And, uh, and it would help, I think, a lot if we start to unpick them and, uh, and, and, and look at them separately. So one lens is obviously uh, what is the risk to me as a company eh, of uh, bad or good ESG practices. Uh, and if you do it very well, then you can even include it, like I said, in, in, in your pricing methodologies. And I think a lot of the corporate reporting, annual reporting, uh, will, will indeed focus on, on that particular lens. But I think there's a few other lenses that we must not forget. Um, one is actually the client. So that's the value creation angle that we discussed. The third one certainly is also, what is my impact to people and, and, and planet? Right? And there, of course, we've got some downside risks in the ESG space, but also certainly opportunities. How can we improve, for example, biodiversity? And I think the final lens is then, uh, how do I report to an investor in me again and enable them to be able to report about their risks? And what I find is often people confuse these things, mix them up when they talk about climate risk. Are they now talking about the risk to the planet because of the emissions or are they talking to the risk to portfolio? And, And I think when you start to unpick these lenses and actually are very diligent about how you report against each of these different parts, um, a lot clarifies and you're actually starting to help your investors and uh, the theme of this talk, you're building trust, right? Because you're helping them actually report their stakeholders uh, for, for, for their obligations. And you also find that, that actually in the alphabet soup 
uh, typically, typically each each uh, acronym focuses slightly. Uh, to that particular lens, I just wanted to make that point. But, but, and, and Eric, I'm going back to you because, because that's great. You separate them, but then as an investor, when I'm trying to analyze a company, I'm then having to analyze this part, this part, this part, this part. What ties it together? How do I come out with a simple set of metrics that I can take to my investment committee, a benchmark, the MSCI of ESG? What can I take to the investment committee for them to know that I'm actually consciously putting a proposal to them that they can benchmark. Eric. Yeah, so uh, you, you've asked the wrong person about uh, what are the what's the minimum number because I don't it is uh, it is completely dependent on the business. Uh, you know this idea that there are five things if every company reported these five things everybody would be better off. You know I, I I'm sorry but I don't I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is to is to really, I think it was getting at it is understand that company uh, and and that company is going to be different even if it's in the same sector as a as a competitor company uh, and it's going to be as a result of their governance. It's going to be a result of of what their footprint is from an environmental standpoint and it's going to be based on on how do they treat people, you know, both their employees as well as customers as well as society at large. So. So I, I, I'm resistant to say that there's a minimum set that if everybody did it, you know, we're all on our way. I'll leave that space to the raiders and rankers and, and others who develop their models uh, for what they think is important. But I want to get back to this idea that there are different lenses, and that's absolutely right. And if you go back and read the, uh, the paper that the Group of Five did last September, uh, it, it tries to highlight that point that there are – and the EU has, has – Coined the term this double materiality to try to try to better articulate that there is a focus and a need for better understanding of the impacts of the world on the company and the financial prospects and value creation prospects for that company. But equally important is what is that company doing to society and the planet? Whether or not it is financially consequential to that individual entity. Policymakers, we as members of society of communities need to understand that collective view, that what is that systemic risk that is going on out there? I mean, you could argue, uh, and I've tried to argue this, but, you know, you could look at climate risk, uh, as we now understand today, was a systemic risk, you know, 30 years ago when it started to be identified and so on. And, and the fact that we didn't have the collective global will to do much about it has now resulted in it being a, a financially material risk to a larger portion of our economy and to us as individuals. Uh, and, and so this is a case of it's, it's migrated, that risk has migrated towards us. You know, what we need to have is a lens on what's coming at us next. Maybe it's biodiversity, you know, which was mentioned, which is an area that, uh, that GRI is, is beginning to focus on intensely. Uh, and maybe it's other issues, and and certainly uh, uh, income inequality and and racial issues are are from a societal standpoint. Also, you know, can you boil it down to say it's financially material to an individual company? You know, in some cases you may be able to do that, but as a society, you know, and and this particularly in, income inequality and across uh, across the world, you know, this is uh, these are these are consequential. So we do need to have the. The information that allows investors and policymakers to make evaluations as to well, what levers do we want to change? Do I need to do I need to start to rein in some of these activities or practices that companies are doing because of the societal impact, not not necessarily because of what it's impacting the individual company. So I think you know that idea, and this you know then evolves into this you know sort of dynamic materiality. So something that a company is impacting out in the world today. As I said, if it if it's less unremediated and unaddressed, it could well turn into a financially material item for them. So, so I think you're spot on. It is a matter of focus, and the use of the of the frameworks and the standards out there do have a particular focus, uh, and that's why we're trying to bring it together with a comprehensive uh, uh, approach to both 
perspectives, if you will, of, of what's important. Eric, Eric, it's 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 you know, I, I you push back at me, I'm gonna push back a little bit <laughs> there too. I mean you're talking about a higher purpose. You're talking about a much higher purpose behind this. But but investors are simply looking at efficient deployment of capital. Um, and they're, they're, they don't have a higher purpose, do they? I mean, how, how, how do you do? How, how do you give an investment manager whose bonus is measured simply on the return on equity or return on his investment? How, how do you give him a higher purpose when he's looking at a company? Surely, all he wants to know is that company the risk is managed. Yeah, I get you on the risk piece, but how does it create additional value? I don't want to push you too much on it, Gary. <laughs> across to Jeanette because Jeanette you, you, you're on the board of, of companies and so you're actually in between those investors you're representing those shareholders and you've got to translate the shareholder desire to management are those shareholders really asking for it or is it just the environment around the governance good fluffy stuff that's asking for it or is there a real demand increasingly there is a real demand so, so I think definitely it's, it's coming from the investor side. Uh, and I do think they're going to, to drive it big time. Uh, and with that said, I also want to say that I, I, th- I believe that the big companies in this world, many of those are already on the journey. I mean, they are starting to report. They've got it right, basically right. Uh, and they know this is important. They understand that either they are going to get the pressure from investors all of the stakeholders or from the bank in terms of cost of capital, as was already mentioned. But in this world, we also have so many SMVs, the smaller ones. Mm. So how do we get them on board? How do we also make sure that this is not getting so complicated that they give up before they get started? So I think we don't have time to, to mm. solve it here. Um, but I think that's hugely important going forward to, to really uh, make things happen. I can see it as a challenge for the MSME sector. And I remember once as an investor being told by a company, Piers, I can give you a perfectly reported loss or a transparent profit. Which would yeah. you prefer to have? <laughs> <laughs> a challenging state. Jordi, over to you. And we're coming close to the end now. So perhaps I'd just like to encourage you to think about wrap up comments that you'd like to be putting forward, the messages you'd really like to convey to our audience. Yori, over to you now. Uh, I only want to explain that we are in the first step of the implementation of ESG. ESG is like a triangle, and in each side is environment, another side is social, another side is governance. Mm-hmm. But the importance in the second step is the vertex of all of these sides. When we try to intersect environmental and social uh, issues. We try to talk about healthy in the in the old planet. When we try to intersect social and governance, we talk about equitables. Uh, when we intersect uh, environment and governance, we talk about viable uh, projects. All of this, all of the our companies in the developed countries do this. Is not a new uh, and matter for our companies. In emerging countries, could be um, a purpose very uh, with a high level for several companies. But in all the compliance in the first world is is enough to uh, accomplish all the ESG procedures now in, in the in the present. Yuri, thanks very much indeed. Yorim, coming to you, any sort of thoughts, uh, subjects we haven't really covered properly, anything you'd like to build on? Or maybe a, a, a brief summary, I think, of, of, of the pitch to investors on, uh, on, on ESG for me would be managing the risks obviously makes sense. You don't want any headaches. Uh, I think we've demonstrated there's a clear business case to ESG performance management. It will ultimately actually improve the bottom line of your investees and I think also increasingly actually being able to uh, illustrate the positive impacts to uh, people and planet will improve at all levels uh, the ability (laughs) to uh, to raise funding. Uh, Retail investors uh, definitely want a financial return but increasingly they're also very interested in knowing uh, and feeling good about how their money does good for the world. So I think 
being transparent about ESG and real and integrating it fully into your business makes clear business sense. Excellent. Eric, to you, and then Jeanette will have the last word. Great. So, uh, so first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to this. It's been a very interesting discussion. I think uh, from, from my standpoint, you know, we, we believe that tra- and picking up on the comments, you know, transparency is is really the answer and, and in, in a lot of respects. And, and so transparency, from my perspective, is that it, if, if a company is practicing transparency against all of the dimensions that we've talk, been talking about, it, it causes them to be much more self-aware of what's happening.